It's mysterious, it's deadly, and it's baffling medical science. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Once thought to affect only promiscuous homosexual males, AIDS is now spreading in epidemic proportions to other segments of the population. If uh, the trends continue as they are, I think we can predict that the acquired immune deficiency syndrome is a, is a highly fatal illness likely to remain with us. Uh, for the next decade. Tonight, we'll focus on this new disease and we'll talk live with three scientists involved in the search for its cause and its cure. Also, we'll have a report on the homecoming of John Koval, the Pittsburgh heart transplant patient whose surgery we documented here on Nightline one month ago. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. The disease has already claimed more victims than Legionnaire's disease and toxic shock syndrome combined. More than 800 cases nationwide, 300 plus of those fatal. And every day, three more cases are identified. And yet, still, surprisingly few people are familiar with the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or the acronym by which it's frequently identified, AIDS. The reason for that may lie, in part, in the character of its most common victims. When AIDS first cropped up about 18 months ago, almost all its victims were homosexual males who frequently changed sexual partners. Alarming enough to that particular segment of society, but, so it first appeared, not threatening to the public at large. But that seems to be changing, and the disease may be spreading. Here's Nightline correspondent Betty Rollins. And he's breathing comfortable now. He has, has been breathing comfortable at home. Yeah, Ahmed Carlisle is only 18 months old, but he has spent most of his life fighting a new deadly disease that no one understands. Not where it comes from, how to treat it, or how to stop it from spreading. It's not even that easy to recognize when it's there. Well, I had no inkling that it still was anything specially wrong. I just, it was just that he was getting sick every month from last, well, 1981. Every month from November, he was in the hospital. Getting sick how? Oh, fevers, first of all. Started out with just fevers all the time. Fevers and ear infections. Okay, the first pneumonia was in February of 82. And then after that, he was getting pneumonia every month. Ahmed's doctor, James Oleski, is director of immunology at St. Michael's Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey. Over the last year, we've noticed we've had an epidemic of that. We've seen many children with very unusual immunological defects. Initially, I thought we were seeing children with these inherited defects, but then it became too many. Such as what? What exactly were you seeing? We were seeing children dying of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. Uh, that parasitic pneumonia that also causes death and pneumonia in the adults. Of it in me, I guess it must have come from me. Ahmed's ailment is called AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. In the strict sense, AIDS isn't a disease at all, but a severe breakdown of the body's immune system, which leads to disease. Dr. Curran is head of the AIDS task force at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. We've received reports of now 11 children um, with uh, severe opportunistic infections and unexplained deficiency in their immune system. Nine of these 11 children have died. But children are only the latest group to be struck with this affliction, which has now surfaced in 33 states. At the Center for Disease Control, they have two strategies for trying to figure the syndrome out. One is in the laboratory, where researchers are looking for the specific infectious agent or virus that might be the cause of the syndrome. And the other strategy, called epidemiological, has medical investigators studying patients in terms of what ethnic, sexual, or other group they belong to. When AIDS was first discovered more than two years ago, it was sometimes called the gay plague. That's because virtually all of the victims were homosexual, and many of them wound up with a rare and often deadly form of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. Hi, hey, Bill. Hi. Hi, this is Roger McFarland from the Gay Men's Health Crisis. Oh, hi. Hi, what can I do for you? Yeah, um, I seem to have Kaposi's sarcoma. Hotlines in New York and other cities where the greatest number of people were afflicted began getting about 50 calls a day from worried homosexuals. 
Today, still, the largest number of victims, 75%, are homosexuals, particularly those with many sexual partners. But several other groups have been affected as well. 14% are intravenous drug users. 5% are Haitian immigrants. 1% are hemophiliacs and 6% fall into none of those categories. 94% of the victims are male. In addition, 20 children have AIDS-like symptoms. And most of the children have had a parent or close family friend who also had the syndrome. Do you have it too? Yeah. They told me my immune system, my immune cells are low too. So far, 40% of all those who have been afflicted have died. And the Center for Disease Control says that the mortality rate could turn out to be as high as 80%. The groups affected have provided some clues about AIDS. Dr. Spartaco Belomo is head of adult immunology at St. Michael's in Newark. AIDS, AIDS uh, seems to be transmitted via contact either with blood, saliva, urine, or feces. Sperm? Also sperm. In other words, any ex Any excrement? Region? excretion or secretion seems to be the key and that's what we're looking into now at St. Michael's. What about the Haitians? Well that's an interesting point. Uh, what we feel is that there's a, a ritualistic voodoo rite that we know that they, some Haitians do have in where they come in contact with excrement either blood or urine or feces of various animals that may again may transmit this unknown agent since coincidentally we noticed the arrival of the Haitians with the arrival of the AIDS syndrome. The AIDS story took a new turn when at the San Francisco hospital a 20 month old baby was found to have the syndrome. He had received a blood transfusion from a donor who turned out to have AIDS and later died. The San Francisco case was alarming for two reasons. First because a child was now a victim of AIDS and second, because in all likelihood, the child became a victim through a blood transfusion. As a result, people who run blood banks, like this one in New Jersey, have a new worry. Our concern is that there is no method currently available to screen blood donors so that the donors don't transmit the AIDS syndrome to the patients. David Ben Harash is five years old and a hemophiliac which means he gets frequent transfusions of blood products from a variety of sources. I love it. I just love it. I love it. No, don't. don't even hurt. All right, just a little skip me skip about when I find the vein. When I find the vein, I hope I will feel better. I forgot there's a hemophilia again. It's hard to put the And it's really great. Okay, don't move and now. The doctors at St. Michael's don't know yet if David has AIDS but he has had some symptoms. To think that you're injecting your child with blood that may, be, may kill him eventually, is, it's, it's just frightening because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know to give him or not to give him. And you have to give him because otherwise, you know, dreadful things will happen from the hemophilia. Like most other AIDS victims, adults and children, little Ahmed is getting a lot of medication, antibiotics mostly, and they have helped control some of his infections. Some of the infections are treatable, but the problem is that the immune defect stays there, so they just get one more infection after we cure that infection. And of course, some of the viral infections, we have no specific therapy for it. And if uh, the trends continue as they are, I think we can predict that the acquired immune deficiency syndrome is a, is a highly fatal illness likely to remain with us uh, for the next decade. And I guess we're more upset when disease occurs in children than, than in other situations. Uh, so I'm upset by it. I'm frustrated that since we don't know what the agent is, we don't have any specific therapies. Uh, we have a lot of ideas and, and we're trying some of the ideas. We have had now eight children, we've lost four and we don't want to lose the other four. Okay, good seeing you again. Good seeing him, and good seeing him do so well. This is Betty Rollin for Nightline in Newark. When we return, we'll talk to the federal government's chief AIDS investigator and with two other medical experts about research into the cause of the disease and what's being done to prevent it from spreading. 
Leading the national inquiry into AIDS diseases, Dr. James Curran, coordinator of the AIDS Task Force at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. He joins us from our Huntsville, Alabama affiliate, WAAY. And in our New York studios are Dr. Joseph Bovey, a professor at Yale University's medical school and an expert in diseases transmitted through blood transfusions. And Dr. Roger Enloe, a clinical investigator at New York City's Hospital for Joint Diseases. Dr. Enloe represented the National Gay Task Force at a recent meeting on AIDS convened by the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Kern, what do we know now about AIDS that perhaps we didn't know 18 months ago? Well, Ted, the, uh, unfortunately, the cause of AIDS remains unknown. But uh, over the past year and a half, when the first cases were investigated, a large amount has been learned about the epidemiologic characteristics of the AIDS cases. And the overwhelming evidence now of the occurrence of this very dramatic illness in these seemingly uh, uh, different groups of people uh, suggests that it probably is caused by an infectious transmissible agent. All right, what do you see as the, as the common thread? I mean, as we see it here, homosexual males, Haitians, now young children. Is there, a, uh, is, is there one common element here that is identifiable in all these different uh, categories? Well, there are infections that uh, are similar to the model of this, uh, of this unknown cause. And one of those is an infection in, called hepatitis B. Uh, hepatitis B is common in all of these groups is uh, transmitted uh, sexually among homosexual men and through blood products, the hemophiliacs and others. Let me turn for a moment to uh, Dr. Bovey. Uh, the, I think what's perhaps the most terrifying thing, at least to parents of small children, is the notion that you take your child in, or to anyone, for a blood transfusion, and you may indeed, through the transfusion, be getting AIDS. Is there no way to identify from a donor, whether that person has or, or to identify someone suffering from AIDS when you take blood from them? There is no way. Why not? There is no way. There's no test for AIDS, and we don't have enough information about the cause. We've not been able to isolate an agent, and while the evidence is very good that it's spread in some cases by transfusion of blood products and perhaps by blood, we're really not able to identify anything in those products, such as we can for, say, the hepatitis B virus, we have no way to test the product for the agent of AIDS, if indeed there is an agent. So there is, in, in effect, <coughs> some dormant quality in the blood that then develops, what, a few months later? How, how well, long after a transfusion would someone, would, would someone show symptoms? One of, the, one of the real difficulties we have here is this dormant or latent or incubation period is a lot longer than a few months. It may be as long as a year or longer. So that it appears, and I, I think I must stress that we're really beginning to think about this disease as an infectious disease, but we have no proof yet. We've not isolated the agent. But it appears that the donor is infectious for a year and long before the donor feels ill. So these are donors who are feeling well, who give blood or uh, plasma for the production of factor eight for the hemophiliacs while they're feeling well and yet are carriers of the agent if there is an agent. Is it theoretically possible to keep blood long enough? I mean, to put it in yeah. storage long enough so that you could then identify or so that at least the, the, the donor could be identified as someone with AIDS? Well, we can freeze uh, red cells now for about a year or longer uh, three years is a good long time for freezing of red cells, but the practicality of it uh, is uh, mind-boggling. We couldn't possibly do it on a practical level, nor would it be possible really to go back and trace uh, six or seven million donors for three years and keep records on who gave three to four years ago, where they are, what their health is now, so that uh, even if we could mount a campaign to freeze red cells, we couldn't possibly identify those donors who gave three or two or even one year ago and are now ill. I want to phrase this next question very carefully because I, I don't want to be alarmist, but it is, it is theoretically possible then that as the number of people with AIDS grows, that this could 
move geometrically out into the general population. It's, to me, not only theoretically possible, but very frightening. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to ask the same dumb question again. What can you do about it? Well, I think the only thing we can do now is hope that in the laboratory, people will make progress and find a test. Secondly, we can look at those areas and populations where we at least think AIDS may be more common and try to find ways to screen blood donors and ask that those who might be exposed to AIDS or in areas or in uh, lifestyles or situations where AIDS is of high frequency uh, voluntarily refrain from giving blood. But as we're beginning to see, AIDS is no longer a disease that's restricted to a small segment of the population. And the incubation period is so long that anything we might do now would take at least a year before we know whether we made a good move or not. Dr. Enlow, how does, how does a new disease come into being? I mean, it seems to have been identified, what, for the first time 18 months, a couple of years ago. How does something like that first crop up? Well, Ted, it, that's part of the mystery, of course, what the origin of this disease is, to say nothing of the fact that we know very little, essentially, about the natural history of the process. And as Dr. Curran and Dr. Bove have both mentioned, we don't even have really good tests. In fact, as an immunologist, uh, we're essentially using tools which were developed in research laboratories and pressing them immediately into clinical service, that is, evaluating patients who are sick. And the interpretation of those results are still up in the air in many cases. We don't have good, efficient, cost-effective means of evaluating the immune system for patients. Most of them are labor-intensive and very um, expensive. Are there any theories as to, as to why this disease seems to have struck a disproportionately high number of homosexuals? I, I think that it goes back to the um, situation that we were talking about where um, with increased numbers of different sexual contacts, and that's of course in the CDC um, case control study the most uh, striking risk factor those individuals who were cases with AIDS and its complications seem to have an increased number of different sexual partners. And that suggests, again, that you have to have some critical level above which you will eventually come in contact with somebody who can transmit it. But why would that be, why would that be more true of, of uh, homosexuals who engage in, in switching partners a lot and not true of heterosexuals? No, in fact, that's a very important point, Ted, that uh, we need not necessarily believe that it is restricted to the gay communities in the United States or urban gay communities. Uh, in fact, I think the evidence is showing that it's expanding beyond that. Um, in terms of, I want to come back to something that Dr. Dr. Bove mentioned, and in terms of screening individuals, I think that the experience in trying to eradicate hepatitis B virus infections from blood transfusions in the days before we had a test for that virus, it was relatively unsuccessful. We still had a significant occurrence of hepatitis B transmission from blood transfusions despite every effort to screen donors. And I think that puts the pressure back on those of us in the laboratory to come up with an answer that allows us to definitively screen blood. That's the only practical solution. Dr. Curran, in, in the few seconds that are left to us, how close are we to that now? Not we, you. Well, there are many people uh, at CDC and the National Institute of Health and especially at uh, uh, medical centers and research labs around the country that are tr working very hard. Uh, you never know until it's, you found it, but uh, we, I agree with Dr. Enlow and Dr. Bovey that it's uh, very important that the cause of this uh, disease is found. But the answer really is you're no closer than you were six months ago or a year ago. Well, the answer is that there's no uh, laboratory agent that's been identified that causes AIDS. Uh, a, a number of uh, techniques have been tried uh, to no success and, and ruled out as successful and uh, to some extent these are uh, uh, hit and miss procedures but uh, as you systematically work through them you at least uh, can use refined techniques. Is there anything that worried parents can do uh, to, to, <laughs> to what? To keep their children away from this? I don't know how else to put it. Well I think that uh, we can make certain prevention recommendations for AIDS uh, even though uh, the cause is not found and, and they won't be perfect but 
clearly uh, all of the groups at risk uh, can examine their risk factors and, uh, and try to uh, cut down on their exposure uh, to possible uh, uh, AIDS agents. I think, uh, Dr. Curran, I'm afraid I have to interrupt, and it's a particularly inopportune time, but I thank you very much, and Dr. Bovey and Dr. Enloe. When we return, we'll update our Nightline broadcast on John Koval, whose life was saved last month when doctors gave him a new heart. A month ago, we documented John Koval's heart transplant surgery, the odyssey of life in transit. Today, a new chapter in that odyssey began when John Koval left Pittsburgh's Presbyterian Hospital and went home. Hillary Brown was there. Five weeks ago, John Koval looked like this, pale, breathless, barely able to lift his small son, without a heart transplant, a dying man. The next night, he was rushed into surgery when the accidental death of a young man 65 miles away suddenly provided surgeons with a healthy organ of the right blood and tissue type. The operation took only four and a half hours. And it was a success. Today, John Koval was discharged from the Presbyterian University Hospital here in Pittsburgh, looking and feeling like a new man. After almost 40 days in bed, his knees are a little weak, and for the next few months, he'll need help getting up and down stairs. A slight handicap, but not enough to keep him from getting home in time for Christmas. Home sweet home. John's neighbors were on hand to greet him, some much more emotional than he was about his homecoming. Hi, how you doing? John's wife, Laurie, says the worst thing about the operation was the worry that it might fail. What surprised John was that it didn't hurt. And he did not experience as much pain as he expected. It's not really as much as, I really, almost nothing. Almost no almost pain? Almost nothing, almost nothing. I would say maybe a dentist is even worse. <laughs> From now on, John's diet will have to be low on fats, though he must eat 2,400 calories a day to help build up his strength. And for the rest of his life, he'll have to take cyclosporine, an experimental new drug that helps prevent infection and the body's tendency to reject an implanted organ. For today, his orders are to take it easy, listening to the music that he loves, trimming the Christmas tree, putting up all the get well cards he received in hospital, and most important, simply enjoying the old fashioned pleasures of being a husband and father. This is Hillary Brown for Nightline in Pittsburgh. I'll be back in a moment. Coming up next on The Last Word, Greg Jackson continues our discussion of AIDS. You'll be able to phone in your questions to Dr. Roger Enloe and to an AIDS victim. Also, this is Drunk Driving Awareness Week. Greg Jackson will talk to a man who lost two children and three grandchildren in an accident caused by a drunken driver last Christmas. And Phil Donahue examines a move to ban beer and wine advertising on TV. That's our report on Nightline for tonight. For all of us here at ABC News, I'm Ted Koppel.